in my very short life, I'm only 62, um, I have, I've found, guys, that most politicians are real good people. They're just people that want to be a part of uh, maintaining and, and improving the way we do life. And so it's great to have these guys here with us. Uh, what I want to do now is probably a wee bit controversial given the statement on separation of church and state, which I completely disagree with as well. Uh, I agree with it in its original form, and we're not going to go into that this morning, but I don't agree with the way we've interpreted it. And so I want to ask us the question this morning. This is a question for everyone. Whether you're here, whether you're online, whether you're overseas, I know we have some international guests. Should Christians be involved in politics? Now, I hope that that is a rhetorical question. Should Christians be involved in politics? The fact is, whenever there is an intersection between faith and politics, people, just like you and I, tend to get a bit anxious. And arguments abound in historical problems of Christendom and the principles of separation and church and state. But the fact is, during the 2019 election, there was a massive leftist attack uh, that came from different quarters, but mostly from, obviously, the opposition and the left of politics, that had found that they had some candy all of a sudden. All of a sudden, we had a, a Prime Minister who was an overt Christian, who expressed his faith in similar ways to what we did this morning. And so we saw images of Scott Morrison with his eyes closed, hands raised, worshipping Jesus, just like we did this morning. And certain people thought, wow, this is such an opportunity, these guys are done for. And so we went into the 2019 election with incredible odds stacked against the return of Scott Morrison into the federal sphere. Now, I've got to say, guys, we're not partisan, all right? I'm not a supporter of any particular political party. What I am a supporter of is people that stand for the things that we stand for. So history shows that the government's election vis victory in 2019 defied the polls and reset the dial on Christian leaders in politics in Australia. Guys, I think, I believe that we have an opportunity. I think this is a moment in history that if we miss it, we're going to regret. I know that churches like ours believe in revival. We believe that there is an imminence in the return of Jesus. It's probably not going to be next year. It could be in a thousand years. That's our vision around here. We have a vision for a thousand years. But the bottom line is, we believe in revival. And if we believe in revival, we believe in a revival that encompasses all of society, including politics. And so, yes, we've experienced previous leaders who were men and women of faith. There's been many of them. John Howard was an astute Christian. But their expression of faith, te faith tended to be more reserved. In Scott Morrison, what we see is a guy who is right out there. And so, obviously, history shows the polls got it wrong. The guys on the left got it wrong. Scott Morrison is our Prime Minister. So maybe regular Australians are not as bent out of shape as Christians are about the idea of Christians in politics. The numbers stack up, they're in our favour, aren't they? So this morning I want to talk about the call to politics. Again, this is controversial, it'll go on YouTube, you can do what you like with it, send it to your friends... I'll probably be out of work next week. But it might shock you guys, but the Christian call to politics is actually fundamental to the Gospels. Not only that, it's fundamental to the Great Commission, the final words that Jesus uttered. It might disturb some of us, but followers of Christ can't avoid the realm of politics. We have to be involved. In Mark 16 and verse 15... It says, he said to them, that's Jesus, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. You see, the Great Commission is holistic. Followers of Jesus are commissioned to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We know that. We know that as a local church. Nearly most churches would, would encompass that, would take hold of it and say, yes, that's what we stand for. We have 2,000 years of missionary activity that's seen missionaries sent to the four corners of the earth. 
And I want to give you just a little glimpse of the effectiveness of that. To get an idea of the numbers involved, the Centre for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon Cronwell, Cronwell Theological Seminary, calculates that the church in 2010 alone sent out 400,000 missionaries around the world. So we know what missions look like. We've been highly effective in reaching whole people groups for the gospel. The Great Commission to go to the world has been effective in reaching 7,000 people groups in 2,000 years. Apparently there is still about 2,500 people groups yet to reach. So we've got some work to do. But we've got a clear mandate to take the gospel of Christ to the whole world. We would all say amen to that this morning, I believe. I want to say, guys, the word translated world, we've got to be careful here, in the original Greek, goes beyond the realm of geographical boundaries. The word is, and in the Greek, it's the word cosmos. This word, according to Thayer's Greek lexicon, uh, has a whole lot of meanings that make it holistic, and I'll go through some of them. Cosmos refers to the world. Cosmos refers to the universe. Now, we haven't yet get, got to evangelizing Mars. Probably not a great idea. Cosmos refers to the earth. Cosmos refers to the inhabitants of the earth. Cosmos refers, in old-fashioned language, the ungodly multitude, the mass, the whole mass of men alienated from God and therefore hostile to the cause of Christ. See how women get a free pass yet again? And then finally, the cosmos refers to the world, the aggregate of things earthly. And it's into that realm that I want to speak to this morning, the world affairs, because that's where politics comes into play. You see, the last point here specifically speaks to the area of politics. The word politics itself comes from another Greek word, politica, which literally means the affairs of the cities. And so when Jesus said, go into all the world, his intention was that followers, just like you and I, would go into all the realms I've just mentioned. Not just the geographical locations, but into every part of human life. So when Jesus said, bring the gospel to the world, that's what he was talking about. Matthew says it this way in Matthew 28, 19. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Who governs the nations? Political leaders. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And then there's a promise, and surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. It's my belief that we have seen in previous years a church that's largely dead because we haven't stuck to the to the script it seems like god hasn't been with us and maybe it's got something to do with the fact that we haven't been obedient to the great commission historically when we see uh, christians obedient to the command of christ what we've seen is that whole nations have prospered we get a lot of bad press about christianity how it's been um you know, dominating and dictating and how it's downtrodden people in other nations and so forth. But the truth is, it doesn't stack up. The great nations on this earth today are great because of Jesus. Because people have taken the gospel into those realms historically. And I want to put it to us this morning, guys, that we've dropped the ball. That our generation has largely dropped the ball. And we've done so because of political correctness, We've done so because of pressure. We've done so because of this distorted notion of church and state. But we've largely dropped the ball. And so, what is our role? Do we have a role to play? And again, I hope that's rhetorical. The role of the church, which is God's people, by the way, this is not an institution. That's where the church and state thing becomes a problem. When we view the church as an institution... There are problems. We don't want Christendom. We don't want politicians running the church. We don't want the church running the government. But we do want God's people involved. That's the true church. And we have a job, and it's primarily, I want to put to us this morning, that, guys, that our role 
in influencing politics is threefold. It firstly gives us the right to teach. This is what we do. This is what discipleship is. Verse 20 of Matthew 28 says that we are able to teach the nations to obey God's command. That's a command. It's a commission that we have. To teach the nations to obey the commands of Christ. Again, if we look at nations that have prospered, they are nations that have basically fallen in behind a Judeo-Christian ethic. And so the, the Ten Commandments have formed the basis of modern society for thousands or for hundreds of years. Where Christendom failed with God's commandments is that it was enforced rather than taught. So there's a distortion that took place. Rather than giving people choices and, allow, and teaching them and educating them well, the church sought to enforce rules. Teaching or discipling is a long game. This thing's a long game. It's not going to be a quick fix. Teaching requires patience. We've got to stick at it, stay at it. We've got to be repetitive. Our message is simple. Jesus Christ is Lord over everything. Over the human bodies, over little babies and over old men. Jesus is Lord. We've got to be repetitious. We've also got to provide good role models. And this begins in families and churches just like Southland. It begins with you as an individual leading by example, showing people what life looks like, reflecting the glory of Jesus in everything that we do. I know it's been said that the gospel needs to be preached and sometimes used words, and I've not been a, a great advocate of that, as you know, because I think the gospel includes words as well. But there is an element of truth in that, isn't there? Our lives should reflect Christ. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy 3, Here is a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer or a leader, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well, and see that his children obey him with proper respect. Now again, that, that goes for men and women. Remember, this is coming from a culture that was steeped in male domination. But the bottom line is we're called to live by example. And so in the political realm, this thing op applies as well. This morning, it's my desire, guys, that we get activated again, that we engage with politics, that we listen to the news, that we talk to our local members that we encourage them, sometimes that we disagree with them and do it respectfully. But we have a role to teach. It's consistency. It's, it doesn't begin and end with the abortion bill. This thing has, waken, I think, woken up a sleeping giant. The church is a sleeping giant. We still have majority rule in Australia. Do you realise that? More than 50% of Australians identify as Christian and profess to attending church. Now, that might be every Christmas. But nonetheless, we have Christian roots. Secondly, the church has a role to prophesy, and as do politicians, Christian politicians. Matthew 10 and verse 16, Jesus says this, I'm sending you. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to the church. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. You can contextualise that, but these guys here would probably agree with me that every time you sign up for Parliament, you're up for a flogging. It might be a verbal flogging, but it's a flogging nonetheless. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them, and to the Gentiles, who said there was no politics in the gospel. That's a promise. Jesus says, you will be brought before governors and kings. And then verse 9, 19, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. 
I don't know about you, but the last time I looked that up, that really equated with prophecy. You see, the prophetic voice is a declaration of God's intention. And as you can read through the lines in that text, it's not going to be very popular. They might arrest you, you might be flogged, you're not going to be very popular most of the time. Because a prophetic message ruffles feathers, it changes the status quo. You see, one of the biggest moves that I've seen in my lifetime in politics has been a move towards a hard left a position of ultra progressive politics. And it's crept right across the board, it's in every party, it's in both the major parties. And so, we as God's people have got to be part of the solution to that issue of moving things back, and it's a long game. The life of a prophet is not an easy gig. But Jesus said, I'm sending you. The truth is, if Jesus is sending you, we don't have an option. Like the Great Commission, this is not an optional extra in the Christian life. He also promised, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, I will give you the words. That's prophecy. Put yourself in harm's way when it comes to offending people. Get used to it because it will happen. When you stand with truth in a world that's heading in another direction, it's not going to go well much of the time. We've got to fall back on what we know and we know that Jesus is for us. This is a troubling passage. He says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Not a great picture, guys. Have you seen what a wolf does to a sheep? I'm not going to tell you. But Nev and I were part of the solution when we went hunting a few weeks ago. We didn't see any wolves, but we saw some other scary animals. Some of our mates that came with us, probably. It says, be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you. Again, sounds like the floor in Parliament. These things happen. This is what we're called to. And then he says, on my account, you will be brought before governors and, and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. That is a call to the political realm that we can't avoid. To our politician friends this morning, you guys know that that sounds familiar. You know, that's just the way this thing goes. Some people say it's a dirty business, but we've got to be there. It's a business where there is a lot of darkness and there needs to be light there. I'm very hopeful. When When I see people in our local area like these guys, I'm very hopeful for the future. And we need more people like that. We need people like you to engage as well. Jesus never promised that politics would be a walk in the park. If you feel that you've been sent out like a sheep among wolves, then that's probably the way it's meant to be. If you feel like you've been flogged and humiliated, then you're probably doing the right thing. Welcome to the prophetic ministry. You see, whenever the church opposes those things that violate God's commands, we become a prophetic voice, win, lose or draw. For many of us, we feel that we lost the whole debate for abortion. Whether we won it or lost it or whether it was a draw, I don't know. I know that there's lives involved and that concerns me greatly. But we were a prophetic voice. There were 5,000 people in the city of Adelaide that stood up. You don't get rallies that big around here. This is not a big city. Remember this, the thing about prophets is that they are on the winning side even when it doesn't appear that they are because they speak the truth. So we're called to teach, we're called to prophesy and we're called to have compassion. More than any other religion or agency, the church is called to have compassion on the poor and the lost and the hurting and the marginalised and the list goes on. We can't be blind to those people. In Matthew 9, verse 35, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. The King James Version of that actually does a better job. It says, Jesus was moved with compassion. The reason it does a better job is the word that's translated compassion in the Greek is a word, it's an ugly, horrible word, 
it refers to a gut-wrenching twisting of the bowels. So when we look at the poor, we should be so connected with their cause that it causes us to get upset on the inside. This manifests in a deep physical movement in the bowels, and I know that I'm becoming way too prescriptive for Sunday morning. And it's produced by a profoundly emotional reaction to the plight of someone who is distressed, injured, or otherwise profoundly inconvenienced. Compassion isn't pity. Compassion can't be solved by law or legislation. Compassion comes because Jesus is putting a part of him in us when we look at the poor, when we see the issues that are going on out in the streets. I've shared with many of you, no secrets around here, we have a son who has been an ice addict for the last two years and is now going through uh, withdrawals and it's been enforced by the state, thankfully. And so he's in a situation now where he's been drug-free for three months. Guys, I've got to say it's been a painful process, not just for him, his family, for us, for everyone that know and love him. And so we know what compassion feels like. It moves you on the inside. It's easy when you see it with someone you know and love. But you see, we as a church and as political, a political people, we're called to be moved to compassion for the people out there. I remember Deb sharing uh, some time ago that she was praying for our son Daniel and um, she was crying out to the Lord and saying, Lord, why can't you save him and would you bring him back and so forth and she was travailing. Deb's great at fasting, she's great at praying and she heard very clearly the Lord say to her, yes, I've heard your prayers but what about my children? You see, our families are way bigger than our immediate family. And when God calls you guys to politics, whatever that might look like, it includes way more than your family. Compassion of this kind should move us to heroic and selfless acts of kindness that stand out from the crowd. They're completely different. You see, when you enter politics... And there are many career politicians, and I take my hat off to them. God bless them. But when you enter politics, it is very easy to enter politics with a motive to being re-elected the next time. So there's a whole dynamic that goes with that, that means that you've got to be careful what you say, careful with who you hang out with, careful with policy and so forth. I want to suggest this morning that if you guys are prepared to enter politics... Make it a selfless act. You may or may not be elected. You may just sharpen the pencils. I don't think they do that anymore. You may just be like Matt is, and his boss is sitting in the front row here, so it was very brave for Matt to sing this morning when Steve's sitting in the front row. You may be called to that. But whatever it is, you've got to stand for what's right. And you've got to hold it loosely. Politics is a game that you hold loosely. It's a bit like pastoring. It's a bit like many of your jobs. We don't want people to lead us who say what we want to hear because they usually get that wrong. We want people to lead us who are people of character and are prepared to be voted out at the next election because of what they stood for. I want to say to you guys, we're going to go with you. We're gonna, we're, if you guys are brave, we're going to be brave with you. Christ, the Christian call to po- po- politics must include a gut-felt response to the plight of the poor. Again, I'm not talking about handouts and all sorts of packages that we can be remote from those people. It includes being broken on the inside for people that are suffering. Modern-day leftism has sadly departed from the true social justice that was once owned by our friends in the more progressive parties. If you're a Labour person, I want to tell you this morning, I used to vote Labour. I'm almost in a position where I could say I used to vote Liberal. I was almost ready to give up on the whole thing and not vote for anybody and just break the law. But what I've discovered is we've got to be a part of the solution. This thing's not for the faint-hearted. It really is not. We've already seen in Matthew 10 that when Jesus sends us out to serve him, we should expect to be flogged and imprisoned 
because of who we are and what we stand for. Persecution will follow everyone who stands for truth and justice. And today, this is as true as it ever has been. Yet the call is still clear. We have been sent to the cosmos, including the realm of politics. And we have a mandate and we have a mission. John 17, and we're coming in for landing, guys. Verse 14, again, Jesus says, I've given them your word and the world has hated them. For they were not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, the cosmos, or the realm of politics, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you send me into the world, I have sent you into the world, into the cosmos. So, we're done. But before we finish up, how do we engage? How do we react to this? We can sit on the sidelines. We can keep writing letters to politicians. And I suggest that that's a good thing to do. Or we can get involved. Like I said before, there are two major parties. We have a two-party system. Particularly here in South Australia, the two parties roughly have a membership I learnt recently of around 5,000 each, give or take, in the state of South Australia. When you join a political party, you actually have the right to ask questions, you have the right to make suggestions, you have the right to vote at meetings, and that will include the pre-selection of local candidates. So when you get a local member or a candidate that's a keeper, you keep them. When you get a local member that's something else, you do something else. But you're a part of the membership of the party. 5,000 in each party in a state with a population of one and a half million. Do the maths. It's not that difficult. I think most of us agree that the passage of legislation that has absolutely no concern for the sanctity of life is abhorrent. We can never accept it. It's really simple. If Christians joined political parties, many of these bills would not even make it into Parliament. They would be cut off at the pass. Absolutely. I did some research, guys. It actually costs about 70 or 80 bucks to join the Liberal or the Labor Party. That's your membership dues for the year. If you're concessional or you're a bit younger, it's going to be cheaper. If you're a union member, it'll be cheaper if you join the Labor Party. So it costs 70 or 80 bucks to join either of those parties. I want to suggest this morning that if you are activated, that that's the first thing to do. If you join the Libs, and I'm only saying this this morning because we have three, four Liberal people here, drop Alex an email. It's easy to find him. He'll start sending his newsletter to you. You'll start to get enlightened. It's a really good thing to do. You start to affect the way things go. And I believe that we have a mandate to do this. I don't think it's a good suggestion. I actually think it's a given. We've just got to do it. So guys, we've got to get, we've got to get active with this stuff. We can no longer sit back and watch the church has failed miserably and it's time for us to lift the game. Amen? I know there's a lot of quiet people out there. I've probably overstepped a few boundaries. But guys, I am so passionate about this. It's really important that we're engaged in this realm. And you never know what doors God might open. You might just be like me, an old guy that'll go along and support someone or occasionally put your hand up and say, why are you doing that? That's really stupid. That might be all you do. Or God might promote you through the ranks, who knows? Unfortunately, we don't have many youth here this morning because they're out. They're all out in the other room. But um, it, this is really important for young people that you start your life on the right foot. So I'm going to ask you to stand, guys, call the team to come back. And we're just going to invite the Holy Spirit to come. And then we're going to do some coffee.